Hey, how's everyone doing today? It is August 18th. Hope you guys had a, a fabulous weekend. Uh, I know I did. Hey, I'll tell you what, I've got a, a fabulous guest today. Uh, give a little background on her. Uh, 1987, she was crowned Miss Asia. In 1996, named uh, w YWCA Woman of the Year. And she also has a nonprofit, uh, Love Across the Ocean. Uh, my guest is a three-time Emmy Award-winning journalist, uh, made broadcast- Four times, four times, but who's four counting? Time. Four times, <laughs> <Excuse me>. four <laughs> times, <laughs> uh, made broadcast <laughs> by becoming the first newscaster ever to anchor the news on two stations in the same market. Please welcome to the show, Lena Nguyen. How are we doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, doing good. Thank you for that correction. I do appreciate that. Uh, you know, I'm just pulling your leg. Uh, but yeah, the thing about Emmy Awards is when you're new in the business, you know, it's great. And and then you find out, oh, well, in order to win Emmys, you actually have to submit, which means you've got to pay for the, um, the you know, you got to pay to enter your stories. Okay. And, yeah. and I stopped doing that a long time ago. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. When, uh, how was childhood for you? Um. Uh, being born in Vietnam and then, you know, moving here to the U.S., was there like a, a culture shock change or, or was it an easy transition? Well, you know, I was really young. I was five and um, we escaped Vietnam. It was just one of those war stories. And so I don't remember much of it. I do know that it was a very hard transition for my parents. So imagine two people in their mid-20s with three small children like picking up and going to a foreign country to live. I mean, leaving your family and your friends and everything that you know uh, to survive, right? So I know that it was very hard from a tropical place like Vietnam, and then we resettled in uh, Minnesota. So of course there was a you know culture shock. There would be a culture shock if you uh, went from California to Minnesota, but oh, yeah. I couldn't have asked for a better place to grow up. I love my Minnesota roots. I love the people of Minnesota. Um, and so I, I loved my childhood. I had a great childhood, you know, thanks to the hard work of my parents and, and the great people that I grew up with. Okay, great. Um, so I'm assuming you're a Vikings fan and you can't stand the Packers. Oh, yeah. I, oh, my gosh. You know, I've got some friends who are Packer fans and I try to overlook that, but I am die hard Vikings fans. It is painful most years to be one, but uh, it is what it is. Right. Uh, I went to the Super Bowl a few years ago, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now. 2020 is so weird. I can't, I lose all track of time, but I was in the front row. Oh it goodness. was in Minnesota. That year, the Vikings had the opportunity to go to the Super Bowl. Of course, it didn't work out, but yep. Huge Vikings fan. Okay, great. Yeah, the the quarterback for the Packers, he lives, or actually, he's from the the town right next to me. Oh, Aaron Rodgers. Oh, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, he's from Chico, California. <laughs> now, I don't know if you. Hey, I don't know if you saw there was a, a story out on Twitter yesterday. I think it was on TMZ, you know, mm -hmm. news. Um, and it was Olivia Munn talking about an ex boyfriend, and boy, she didn't have a lot of nice things to say, and a lot of people were. Um, saying it might have been about Aaron Rodgers. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I didn't click on the link, but I did see that. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. I wonder what Aaron's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So um, when did you first actually catch the bug for, for journalism? Um, ever since I was a little girl, really, like seven, eight years old, I didn't like watching TV a lot, but I loved watching the news. Mm -hmm. And so... Like I would go to bed. My parents were very strict growing up and I would go to bed at eight. My mom would wake me up at 10 knowing that I loved watching the news so I can watch half an hour of news. Uh -huh. So I've always, you know, been around news, always loved it. And as a little girl, I really felt that news reporters were so smart and I loved that they knew everything was that was going on and that they were, you know, seen live at different places. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to know what was going on in the world around me um, and, and be involved in it, meaning I didn't want to just sit back and watch it on the news. I wanted to go talk to people and interview people and get to know them and, and bring issues to people. Uh, so it's, it's been a, a passion of mine since I was a little girl. 
Now, it has changed a lot since when I was that that young, but mm-hmm. you know, at the root of it, I, I think journalism is it's very important and um, have always loved it. Okay, great. Now, was there anybody like in particular that you really looked up to since you you caught that journalism bug, like someone you constantly wanted to watch and mimic and and no. No, um, which is surprising because a lot of times you'll talk to people and they'll say, oh, yeah, I always watch so-and-so. I mean, I worked with a lot of people who, like, idolized people. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked with a a guy very well known now who idolized Peter Jennings, like had a shrine for the guy at his desk, and we'd we'd call him Baby Jennings. Um, and, And because I'm Asian, you know, going throughout my career, people always wondered if my idol was Connie Chung. Yeah. So I really didn't have idols. I watched a lot of different people. Um, and I was, I consider myself always to have been very old school. Mm-hmm. So, and that kind of led to why I got out of the business is because I I still believe in, in old school journalism, you know, like facts only ma'am kind of a kind of a thing uh, and that has changed so much especially here in Los Angeles and in the media market the larger media markets but I didn't have one idol I just I loved watching a lot of different people and picking up things you know that I liked and making sure I I did I didn't do the things that I didn't like right right okay now how did you um handle during your career how did you handle uh, the pressure of like the deadlines? Uh, I love deadlines. I'm one of those people who I will procrastinate if I'm able to. Mm-hmm. So I love deadlines. It gives me something to work for, you know? Like if you tell, and I'm the kind of person, both in my professional life, but but also in my personal life, that if I say I'm going to do something, you can expect that I'm going to do it and hopefully I'll over deliver. That's the way I'd like to operate. So deadlines were never a problem for me. Uh, and I always like to finish early. Now, you know, sometimes in news that that doesn't always happen. Right. But uh, I always prided myself in not missing slot and, you know, managing my time well and getting fast. Um, I, I'm not one of those reporters who take you know, five takes for something. And I just got the hang of it. And, and really, it is a, a, a talent for some people. Some people have a talent for incredible writing. Some people don't even have to write scripts, you know, like Dave Lopez with KCAL 9. He would just, like, it's in his head. And when he tracked something, it just came out of his mouth. Uh, I'm not like that. I like to write. I like to have a script. And so we all work differently, but I loved deadlines. Okay, great, great. Now, out of all the people, you know, you've interviewed, I mean, you've interviewed, I understand, heads of states, presidents, and, and whatnot. Is there that one interview you wish you could have did but didn't have the chance to? Um, hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, of all the big, huge stories, there were so many huge stories in my 26 years in, in, in the career. Uh, I found it, let me tell you what I didn't like to do. And I was always surprised that people said yes to me. When I was a um, general assignment reporter and in Los Angeles, that normally meant like crime, right? Like murder of the day. Yeah. I hated, hated having to go to knock on someone's door when a loved one has been killed. So I, I hated doing it. Yeah. Um, and I was always so shocked that people said yes, that people would talk to me. And then I later learned that I think it's because it's therapeutic, that when you are suffering such a great loss, you want people to know about it. You want to share your despair and, and your anger and your pain, because I think it is therapeutic to let people know that you're hurting. Uh, and I was always shocked that people allowed me into their homes to talk to them a- about it. Um, I've had like many interviews where I, it affected me personally to hear it. Like my gut was, and I would, you know, fight having to cry because I'm one of those people, I'm very empathetic. You know, when I see people in pain and I hear about their stories, I feel their pain. So uh, a lot of the the job was, you know, doing unpleasant things, talking about unpleasant things, uh, talking to people at their worst, you know, right. most of the news is bad news. Um, so it's really hard for me to, to, you know, who do I wish I 
could have interviewed. I've interviewed a lot of cool people. I've, I, and this may sound weird. I find interviewing like prisoners and people who've done awful things and trying to figure out how and why they did this. uh, I find those fascinating, like jailhouse interviews. I just find incredible. So So, uh, so it's it's hard for me to answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so since you brought that up, so maybe like, maybe Charles Manson would have been a good interview interview for you. Oh, t- uh, completely, completely. And and you know, I I have always been really interested in psychology. I studied it in in college, mm-hmm. um, but like a four hour lecture class where you had to take notes starting at eight in the morning kind of turned me off to it. But right. I love trying to figure out what makes people tick. And so when those people are people like a Charles Manson, you know, people who've committed awful crimes, people who, you know, you look at him, you're like, oh my God, he's nuts. Right. I want to talk to him. Uh, and I, I think it's fascinating to hear what they have to say and try to figure out how and why they are the way they are. So yeah, Charles Manson would have been a great interview. Yeah. Now, um, Say if there was someone from the past who's no longer with us, could you pick one person who you would have loved to interviewed? Mm. Well, there's so many They're like historical people. Yeah, I mean, like G- the, like are you Bieber, talking like Montezuma? You know, Abe Lincoln, any, any anybody? Oh, so, you know. Oh gosh, so so many. Uh, uh Buddha. Uh, I'm Buddhist, even, and I have great interest in all world religions. Um, but I, I think that would be great. Uh, you know, I read up on Buddhism. I grew up as a Buddhist Mm -hmm. and there's so many different forms of Buddhism, but I think that would be an amazing interview. Okay. Okay. Good answer. Good answer. Um, what would you tell, um, your younger self? Mm Hmm. Does this have to be professional? <laughs> no, not at all. My, I would tell my younger self to say yes more. I grew up in a very conservative household. Mm-hmm. I was, um, I was always very goal oriented as far as education and career. I said no to a lot of things, and I was a very good girl. I, you know, I. I don't, and I still don't, I, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do any, you know, nothing, no vices for me. Right. Um, but even like on a, on a personal level, like, you know, guys would ask me out and I always would say no. I was always actually very, I, I wasn't much of a social butterfly as far as like going out and stuff like that. I was so focused on, you know, studying, going to school, doing those things. So right. I wish I would have said yes more, you know, I would allow myself to have more fun Um, and I think I learned this pretty quickly in life, but I would tell my younger self. And as I tell a lot of young people that I talk to now is not to worry so much about what other people think, because when you start living for other people, uh, you really lose sight of what's really important. And most people don't figure that out until they're much, much older. Uh, and I know it's also a cultural thing, but you know, don't be so concerned what other people think. It's not, now that's not saying do what you want because right. you can't, you can't just do what you want unless you're a very responsible person who are going, who's going to make good decisions. Right. Yeah. But when we're so concerned about image, about what other people will say about any gossip, when you're so concerned with all that, you are missing out on living your life. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah, my, so that's my, what I would tell myself. I probably wouldn't listen. Yeah. I remember my dad, he uh, had this saying that he would, uh, he'd have me always hold up my hand and he would say, you know, he'd say, mijo, you know, son in Spanish, he'd say, if they're not, you know, helping you to put clothes on your back, he says, put down your, your pinky finger. So I do that. He says that if they're not helping put a, a, a roof on your head or helping you in any other way, physically or mentally, he says, put down your pointer finger. So I did that. He says, now, if they're not family oriented and they're not trying to help you, um, you know, with money or anything like that, anything to help you succeed, he says, put down your ring finger. He says, what's left? (laughs) And 
Yeah, he would say that's <laughs> right. Nice. F them. Who cares what they think? You just yeah. do you and you, you know, support your family and whatnot, but who cares what other people think? Right. Right. But you know, that's, uh, you can say that all you want. It's very hard for a young person to not care. And, and it's just human psychology. And of course we all go through it. Right. But I think the sooner you realize, the sooner you realize that the people who don't actually matter mean in your life, their opinions also don't matter. The sooner you realize that, the sooner you're going to start enjoying your life a lot more. Exactly. Exactly. For sure. Now, earlier in the show, I asked you, you know, when you caught the bug for journalism, um, when was it that you actually lost it or was it burnout or, or what? <laughs> um, I don't know if burnout is the word. I, I it Journalism changed. The industry has changed so much since mm -hmm. I was a little girl. And really, even if you look back, you know, uh, five years ago, it's it's much different today. Um, when I, I started my, my career in Augusta, Georgia, that was my first job market 110. Yeah. Then I jumped to, um, market, gosh, I think it was 19 at the time. Uh, then I came to Sacramento and then I came to Los Angeles. So that's actually a fast move for, for TV careers. Yeah. Um, and when, when I first got my job in Los Angeles, I remember going back to Sacramento and thinking, oh my gosh. Am I ready for this? Is like now I'm hired. Can I really deliver? Mm -hmm. I was. At, it's market number two. Yeah. And then I came to Los Angeles, and it was a whole different animal. The news in Los Angeles is not like the news in most other cities. One of my first stories was George Michael being caught masturbating in the bathroom, right at a, at a good. park. Yeah. And it was the lead story, and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what? In every other market, it would have been maybe an entertainment news. but it, And it was that kind of, to me, kind of sensationalistic type stories. I, I didn't like it. Yeah. And KCAL was the Lakers station, okay? So each time there was a Lakers game, the news that followed it was like a lap dance, you know, to me, it, w it wasn't the news, but they were trying to catch the audience that they had for games. And of course, male audience for basketball games. So they think, well, let's throw in stories about strippers. And, you know, right. that I didn't like. And I fought it. And it was, and then I had to start like choosing my battles because I was becoming difficult for them because I'm like, well, why? Why? That's a dumb story. Why are we doing this? And why? And then I realized, okay, so they hired me to do a job. I need to do my job. Very often I wasn't happy because I didn't like the stories. Right. You know, they wanted me to do a multi-part series on Asian sex slaves. And I fought that too. I said, I don't want that to be my introduction to Los Angeles. Right. I'm more than that. I'm more than the person that you can put on Asian sex slaves. So, um, and that was in 1997 that I came to Los Angeles. So even back then, I was starting to feel like, hmm, maybe journalism isn't what I thought it was. Um, and then it just kind of got worse and worse over the years with these, you know, sweeps pieces that we would do. And I, I really didn't like that. Um, but I held on because it still it was the best job I could dream of. Who else gets to do what I got to do? It wasn't a nine to five job. It wasn't a desk job. I was, it was something different every day. I got up not knowing what the heck I was going to do that day. And to me, that's exciting. I didn't know who I was going to talk to, what city I'd go to, what story I'd cover. And to me, that's a job I can love. Um, and then, then I anchored full time. I was indoors all the time, never really got to meet people anymore, was just reading scripts. And was starting to kind of fight about the scripts I was reading. You know, I'm a big believer in facts and writing it so that there's no slant to the story. Like, don't be using words that lean one way or the other. Um, and for some writers, that was them being creative. Right. But to me, it's like, no, that's you showing what you think about the story. And so then now I was having those kind of battles. 
Um, and so I would say maybe five years ago, I really started to lose the passion for what I was doing because what I was doing wasn't what I wanted anymore. It had changed too much. Um, and so in 2018, I finally had the guts to leave. And it was the best decision I have ever made. I found that I was happier. I was like breathing. I mean, before, yeah. when you're a newscaster, you're always a newscaster. Even when you're home, even when you're out with your kids, on the weekends, on vacation, you're always a newscaster. When I see smoke, I want to call the station. When I see an accident, I want to, you know, it, it was 24 7. Um, so, you know, a after I walked away in 2018, I have not watched a single newscast since July 26, 2018. And guess what? I'm still here. Yeah. I still get my information and I'm happy. Like, wow, the world did not revol revolve around the news. You know, I mean, right. sure, it's important to keep up on, on daily events and issues. But that 24-7 of being in it all the time was really getting to me. And I was missing out on life and being a mom and being there for my kids. You know, I, right. I didn't tuck my kids in. I was I worked nights. Uh, and most people don't even think about it. So in 2018, when I was able to like tuck my kids in at night and say goodnight to them, mm -hmm. that to me was like amazing, you know? Yeah. And to most people, they took it for granted. They really took th those things for granted. So, yeah. um, and I'm not putting the business down. It was the best, best career I could have asked for. To me, it was a dream job. But when it stopped being dreamy, when it stopped being a dream, right. I knew I had to get out. And you left on your own terms. Yes, and 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 I'll tell you, um, it, it wasn't easy. I mean, you're thinking about. I made great money, yeah, right. Yeah. So to walk away from money, I mean, it's a good thing to be able to say, but it's yeah. not an easy thing to do. So I walked away from a six figure paycheck. Yeah, didn't have a job. Didn't you know? My backup plan was to breathe. And be with my kids, mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 anyone who gets out of news, I'll tell you. You talk to all of them; they will tell you they're so much happier. Okay, yeah. I mean, I looked up the the amount that that you walked away from, and I mean, bravo to you to be able to do that. And like you said, you walked away, and and you're a lot happier now, and you're able to do the stuff you want to do on your own terms. And since we're talking about that, how did you come up with your, uh, your unscripted podcast? Well, un unscripted was, so right after I uh, left the news business, um, you know, and I spent some time with the kids and stuff. And then it was like, but you know, I miss talking to people. Um, I, I have a, a presence on social media. I'm, I'm, I love engaging with, with my followers and they've become friends to me. And I said, I decided I'm going to do a podcast where I could talk about whatever. Right. And it was my words, right? Not reading anyone else's scripts, not having to fight anyone on what I wanted to talk about or what I wanted to say. Uh, so that was Lena Wynn Unscripted. And I had a ton of fun. That was, and, and the fun part was figuring out the technical stuff. I yeah. piecemealed my studio together. I learned all that on my own. I learned the music and the mixer and the you know microphones mm -hmm. before I had other people doing it for me. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I decided to move and all these life changes. And I turned 50. Um, and I had to knock down the studio and move and stuff. So, so that got uh, put on the back burner. Okay. Okay. Now let's discuss your, your, your new show that you've got called Consenting Adult. <laughs> Yeah. Have you listened yet? I, you know what? Wait, I, how old are you? I'm 55. You are? Yeah. And I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> yeah. I'm 55. Wow. I had no idea. I thought, okay. I thought you were like young kid interested in journalism. No, no. Um, That's amazing. You have a very young voice too. Well, thank you. Um, and and that's funny because I mean you ask my family, 
growing up, you couldn't get two words out of me. I was so shy and introvert. And next thing I know, my kids are in college. They wanted to um, major in communications. And so I'm thinking, okay, what, what a great way to help them, um, you know, get involved in communications. And so I bought this equipment and everything. And I figured, okay, uh, at the time, there was a, a Prop 60 going on and I knew some people from the adult industry and I figured, okay, well, let's help them out. Let's get the word out, you know, to, to vote against this. And so two weeks later, my kids up, come up to me and say, dad, uh, we want to switch majors. And I'm link, uh -oh. thinking, okay, um, okay, that's fine. If that's what you guys want to do, you know, I'll support whatever you want to do. I said, well, what am I supposed to do with all this equipment? <laughs> and they were like, do it yourself. You know, you said you, you're you uh -huh. about this, this subject matter and, and, and the people in that industry help them out. And I'm like, mm -hmm. a minute, okay, I, I'm shy as heck. How am I going to do this? And lo and behold, I went up and, and did my first show and I was like, it's like, you kind of like you. And I was like, hey, I like this. This is kind of cool. Yeah. Wonderful. And, oh, I love it. That's awesome. I've, I've been, been doing it here, what, four, four years now and, and been doing it uh -huh. and just love it. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Well, um, so I just launched my podcast yesterday, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Um, and. I got to tell you, I'm, I don't get nervous. Uh, you know, people look at students often ask me, so do you get nervous before you go on camera or, you know, do you get the butterflies in your stomach? And the answer has always been no. I'm, I'm just not one of those people. I don't get stage fright. You know, when I have to appear on camera, to me, it's like, like, it doesn't make me nervous. Okay. I was so nervous yesterday <laughs> about launching this podcast because it's, the subject matter is, is taboo. You know, we're talking about open marriages and swinging and polyamory and all this stuff that is, um, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people are taking part in it, but no one's really talking about it. I mean, they talk amongst themselves, right. but no one is openly talking about it. Um, and so I was nervous because people who know me, including very close friends and family, you know, know, know the kind of person I am, and they are shocked that I'm talking about this stuff. Now, they're not shocked that I'm able to get people to open up to me, okay? So they know I love talking to people. And people, for whatever reason or whatever it is, that people feel comfortable opening up to me and, and telling me, you know, things that they may not be telling their own family. Right. But I was so nervous on how this would be received. I know there's going to be pushback. Okay, there are just people who don't want to talk about sex. Right. And God forbid you talk about sex and then connect it with people who are like in the 40s, 50s, or 60s because, ew, that's gross. Well, what I'm finding is people, like after they turn 40, but especially into their 50s, there's like this sexual awakening, and I'm amazed. They're active, they're happy, and the best thing is that they're so comfortable with themselves. I mean, they're really living authentically. You know, it's they have finally learned that who cares what other people say, yeah. and they're so much happier, and I think everyone can learn something from them. So, you know, it may not be for you. I know a lot of it is not for me, but I don't judge, and I love at the root of it, it's their open communication and complete honesty that is so refreshing to see and something we are seriously lacking, especially today, this honest, open communication. You know, stop attacking people. Let's just like share something and be okay, even if you don't agree with it. Um, so really, you know, on face value, you're like, ooh, it's a podcast about sex. No, not no. I mean, yes. But it's a lot more than that. And, and I really appreciate the, the support that I've been getting. So it's called Consenting Adults. So uh, give it a listen and um, let me know what you think. I mean, there are people who are like, oh, my gosh, I'm a lifelong Catholic. I don't know if I'm – but I'm going to listen to it. Yeah, I saw and that. And I really tweet. appreciate that support. Yeah, I saw that, that, that tweet that she sent you that, um, about being the Catholic, but she was going to – That's my boss's – that's my old boss's wife who <laughs> is in TV – 
who was uh, like in one of my managers at an, at another station a while ago. Yeah. Uh, she's also from Minnesota. So we've got like conservative people who would never do any of these things, have never talked about any of these things, have never heard about some of these things, mm-hmm. who are listening and saying, wow, you know, and that, that's all I really want is to people to give it a chance and and listen with an open mind. You don't have to go out and do any of it, but hey, if you do, we've got tips for you from people who've been doing it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I, uh, I tuned in and I thought, I thought I was clicking on episode one and it was turned out it was episode three. So it was that mm, mm-hmm. it was the girl with the uh, the husband with the, the five partners. Yeah, yeah, the two or three boyfriends that she had or something like that. Very, very good. And a girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That was a real fun show. <laughs> um, like I said, me, stuff like that's not going to bother me because some of the other content I, I cover is from the adult industry. So this type of, of subject mm-hmm. matter is not going to bother me at all. And maybe some of the people, that's awesome. some of the people that, that I've interviewed, they may want to, maybe, you know, want to come on your show and tell a little bit about their Stuff. Be a guest. That w- that would be awesome. By the way, I want to give a shout out to somebody. Sure. So these these things that, w- that we do, and and you as as a podcaster know a lot of what we do. We depend on support and help from our friends, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it it just that's just the way that it has to be. Well, when you listen to this uh, podcast, take a listen to the music. The music was written especially for the for me for the show um, by a a friend's son who has a garage band. It's a group of young people. Okay. They're, the band's name is um, Defenestration. You can look them up on social media. They're a bunch of 20 something year old kids. Um, they made that song for me. They're a little shocked about the adult content, um, but I wanted to give them some love because I, I told them what I was looking for. You know, I didn't want 70s porn music. And I like rock, and I, I but I wanted something original, and they came up with a great theme song for us. So Defenestration, good. Check them out. Okay, great. Great to hear. Now, is there anything uh, you'd like to say in closing before we close this out, uh, your listeners, fans, whatnot? Um, yeah, I, I am so grateful for... Um, and I hate calling them fans, because that's so whatever. Okay, I, well, follow you know, but... The people who, yeah, the people who have followed me uh, through throughout my career, I, I've been just in Los Angeles, uh, you know, on TV twenty one years, and I so appreciate that. Regardless of what they think about what's going on in the world politically and about this new show, that they support me, and that uh, means a lot to me. That you know, you're putting like your personal feelings for someone else before your personal feelings about a certain issue. Like I will support people even though I may not agree with what they're doing. So unless you're hurting someone, okay? Unless you're hurting someone, I like to support my friends and and their endeavors. So I know it's difficult. It may make you uncomfortable, but you never know. It may be quite intriguing. It's certainly fun to listen to and to escape. So um, give consenting adults a listen and, and see if I don't uh, shock you too much. And maybe you'll keep coming back for more. Exactly. Now, And they can find that on, on Twitter and Instagram and all that? Uh, yes. So um, consenting adults, it's on you know Apple, Spotify, Google Play, on any of the platforms you can get. Uh, a podcast, and then just find us on on social media. Where we're, you know, we just started, so this is like you know ground level, and it's so exciting to see all the people jump on. Every day we're getting more followers, and people are really excited about this. And it's not just a bunch of weirdos, you know, interested in sex. It's like, hey, finally, someone is publicly talking about this stuff. That's a part of everyday life for a lot of people. Exactly, you know, and 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 like I said, you. Uh, starting this, you're the first one, and so people are saying, "Hey, maybe it's okay. I can I can finally talk about this or discuss it, and, and support this." And so with, with that, you know, you're probably going to get a lot of a lot of people who who are wanting to be a guest on your show because of that. Well, I, I sure hope so. And I have to say that um, Ben's Town and McVeigh Media, 
they are backing me on this. And I am so appreciative because there are a lot of big companies who will not touch this subject. Oh, yeah. They know it exists, yeah. but they don't want to be associated with it. Well, why not? It's an issue like everything else. It's a choice like everything else. And we're talking about consensual things. We're not talking about stuff that you know is forced on people or uh, no one's being hurt. We're talking, and that's why I named the show Consenting Adults is because you know it, it's going on out there. Just because we won't talk about it doesn't mean it's going to stop. Right. Well, and that's that's the thing. People need to realize, you know, if it wasn't for two consenting adults, you know, a lot of us wouldn't be here. We so. wouldn't be here. <laughs> so <laughs> You're just, right. Yeah, just just relax, people, and and enjoy the content of the show. You know, and I said I I gave it a listen to it yesterday, and I'm going to catch up today and, and listen to the rest of it. A lot of great content on there for you if if you're into that type of stuff and. Uh, like I said, you know, support Lena. Uh, I've been following her career since uh, KCRA Channel 3. That's when I first got introduced. Oh, to my her. gosh. Yes. Yeah. Um, Sacramento. Because I'm about an hour, about an hour north. And back then, you know, I could still, I could watch, you know, KCRA. But now with all this cable fighting and no, you're going to watch the local. And so I don't really get a chance yeah. to, to watch, you know, Sacramento stations anymore too much. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, I want to thank you for for um, being on it as a guest. I do appreciate it. I really, really do. Thank you. Thanks for hey. You are my first interview after the launch of the show. I, I some people have already contacted me about about uh, appearing on their shows to talk about it. So right. I am happy to be on your show first. Uh, wish you luck, and I'm going to start checking out your stuff. All right. Wow. Thank you. I, I do appreciate it. Okay, guys. Hey, I want to thank you guys for, for tuning in and make sure uh, you check out Consenting Adults uh, with host Lena Wynn. I do appreciate it, guys. Hey, we'll see you next time.